Hello everyone, today I'd like to talk about how you derive the so-called master equations of thermodynamics, uh, particularly thinking about an ideal gas situation. If you like the style of this presentation, please do consider giving my video a like and subscribing to my channel. Okay then, as with any thermodynamics consideration, we're considering the ways that energy go in and out of a substance. So here I've just got four standard substances, a solid, a liquid, a gas, and a mixture of things in the gas phase. And on the sort of big macroscopic real world scale, we kind of know the differences between all of these things. But when we zoom in, it becomes a lot trickier to think about exactly what's going on between all of the particles involved. So we don't necessarily have a way of tracking each single individual particle in these systems when something changes to its situation. So to help us think about what's inside these boxes and what changes, we think about a concept called internal energy, and I'm going to define that as U. So what do we mean by the internal energy? Well, in each of these so-called closed systems, uh, there are a variety of ways that energy can be distributed. And I'm just going to think about this slightly more complicated looking one down here with the mixture first to illustrate this. If we were to supply energy to the system, a variety of things could happen. Each of these particles or molecules or whatever is in this uh, schematic down here, they could move and there's some sort of kinetic energy associated with that. So some of the energy could go into a translation of those um, particles. There are also, say, covalent bonds, like in this um, particle here, that might have an energy associated with them. And also we know that there might be intermolecular forces between all of these systems as well, which is, if you like, another way that we could consider energy being in this system. Okay, and according to the first law of thermodynamics, so-called uh, energy must never be destroyed or created. We know that if we make an infinitesimally small change to the internal energy, like say we try to change the internal energy of one of these systems, this can either come from supplying a small amount of heat, I'm going to call that delta Q, or it can come from supplying a small amount of work, delta W. So this is the heat supplied, and this is the work supplied. Now we have to be a bit careful about what we mean here with our directions of our signs. So I'm going to change the internal energy of say like the gas so i'm going to move down to this system down here so there's a u on the inside and if i change that i can do heat to the system as in i can send in a little bit of heat or i could do work on the system delta w if i do a small amount of heat it will increase the hotness of the system as in if i had a thermometer i could measure a temperature increase if I do a bit of work on this system though, say I'm squashing this box that's got the gas in it, the work done by the gas will actually be in the opposite direction. I'm going to call that delta W prime from us doing the work on the box. So by Newton's third law, that will be an equal and opposite reaction. So if I want to think about du for our system, that's going to be equal to, well, if I put in a small amount of heat, that will increase its hotness. So that will be a positive change. Whereas if I do some work from external to the system on the system, the gas will uh, respond by doing work in the opposite direction. Now let's consider the case where the only thing that changes by us sort of squashing the box is a pure mechanical work. So there's no changes in um, charges, for example, that might be in the system. This is so-called PV work only. Our work done by our system is just simply the pressure times by the change in volume made. Thinking about what the forces are and where they come from in a gas on the edges of the box, the pressure times by a change in volume is directly equivalent to a force being moved by a certain distance. You can even check that with the, the units being pressure, force over area. With our heat components, um, there are some general results from thermodynamics that tell us that uh, if we consider this under reversible conditions, we know that the change in entropy is equal to the change in heat under reversible conditions divided by temperature. Now, subbing all of these in together, I can rearrange my reversible heat change uh, to give me a term, and I get du equals T dS take away P dV. Now, this is the first master equation, so-called the first and second law combined together in one equation. And it tells us what happens if we make a small change in entropy and a small change in volume to the internal energy of the system. 
while that might not seem so useful, but it does give us a way to interlink some of these slightly trickier concepts such as entropy and internal energy with uh, temperature, pressure and volume, which are much easier for us to get a handle on thinking about. Now that we've got this first relationship that links the first and second law of thermodynamics together, there are some other relationships that we can derive that are much more useful for us for experimental science. Now, a long time ago, some clever people worked out that if we define a thing called enthalpy, uh, given a symbol H, we can directly link this law to something that's much easier to measure in the laboratory. So we define enthalpy as the internal energy added to the pressure times by the volume of a system. So taking the total differential, I get dH, so a small infinitesimal change in enthalpy will be equal to a small change in the internal energy plus a small change in the product of PV. Now that product, I'm going to need to use a chain rule to help us get a handle on that. So what we do is we sort of take the differential of one um, and ignore the other one and vice versa. So that will be V dP plus P dV. Now we can go back to our first master equation at the top and we notice that actually we have an expression for, for du and we can use that to substitute in for du down here. So substituting in I can say that dh is equal to tds minus pdv plus vdp plus pdv and now we see the power of why it's useful to define an enthalpy. So these two terms will cancel out and that gives us our second master equation. That's dH equals TDS plus VDP. And this second master equation gives us some other links and relationships between thermodynamic properties. Now this one can be really helpful for us in the lab because if we say at constant pressure, as in dP equals zero, this expression reduces to dH equals TDS. So under these conditions, this bit is directly linked to the reversible heat. So now we could measure these types of changes via a calorimetry experiment, for example. This is directly linked to a formula you might have seen at, say, high school, where the heat is equal to MC, which is the mass times the specific heat capacity times by the temperature rise. Okay, we can, we can do another trick here, continuing on. So another very useful thing that we can deal with in chemistry is to think about a thing called the Gibbs energy. And the Gibbs energy is defined as, well, I'm going to call it G. And that's equal to the enthalpy, take away the product of the temperature and the entropy. And this, again, is just a human construct, but it turns out to be very useful for us. In fact, this will turn out to give us a direct link to the entropy change of the universe for working out whether a process is spontaneous or not. But for now, we can take the total differential of this. So a small change, an infinitesimally small change in the Gibbs energy is going to be equal to a small change in enthalpy. And I've got another total differential that involves a product. So I'm going to need to use the chain rule to expand that out. So dg equals dh minus t ds take away s dt. Now we can usefully use the second master equation to help us simplify this because we know what dh is. So dg is going to be equal to tds plus vdp take tds take s dt. And now we can see again why the Gibbs free energy definition is really useful because these two terms will cancel. And that will leave us with our final master equation, dg is equal to vdp take s dt. And arguably, this is the most useful of all of these um, equations because it directly tells us what happens to the Gibbs free energy change, which is directly linked to the entropy change of the universe via maps to be found in another video, perhaps, to things that we can measure very easily and very, very easily, such as the pressure and the temperature. So just an example of how we might be able to use this formula, if we impose some conditions of constant temperature this time, so constant T, that tells me that dT, the change in T is zero, I can say that dG is equal to V dP. And I can interpret this in multiple ways. For example, I could say that the rate of change of 
gives energy with respect to pressure is equal to volume. And that's a non-obvious relationship, but we could use that to help manipulate other thermodynamic parameters. Alternatively, what we could do with this is integrate it up. So we could integrate between say pressure one to pressure two uh, of dg is equal to, well, the integral of the volume with respect to pressure at P2 and P1. This will tell us the relationship between the Gibbs energy at any pressure two, take away the Gibbs energy at any pressure one, is equal to the integral between uh, pressure one and pressure two V dP. So provided we know a relationship to V, we can go forwards with this. So for example, for an ideal gas, we would know that PV is equal to NRT. And therefore we have an expression for V in terms of P. I'll just make a note now that actually the, the ideal gas is a particularly useful way of looking at some of these problems because it's arguably the simplest way we can deal with thinking about these closed systems. So in an ideal gas, we have a whole load of point particles. We consider their interactions to be zero. So what we're saying is there's no intermolecular forces. We also say they're point particles, therefore there's no covalent bonds. And so we can say anything to do with the internal energy is purely due to translation, the kinetic energy of the particles. And that gives us a particularly simple expression to be dealing with. Right then, I've left that discussion slightly open-ended. Um, if you would like to hear more discussions of thermodynamics topics, do let me know and I can um, pick a few more to, to talk through. If you like the hopefully slightly casual way that I've described this topic, do let me know by giving the video a like and subscribing to my channel.